Thank you all for coming. My name is Bill Steinman. I'm the archivist of the Quantic and Tug Historical Society. Thank you all for coming out on a rainy October evening for one of our special fall events. If you're not a member of the Quantic and Tug Historical Society, I urge you to join. And whether you are a member or not, I imagine many of you have been coming to Quantic and Tog for a long time, or your families have been coming to Quantic and Tog for a long time. You may have interesting artifacts in your attic, in your basement, an old photo album, a box of slides. You might have interesting stories that you've heard or things that you've experienced. We would love to learn about all of it and add to the mosaic that we are preserving in this marvelous, special little community in South County. So please reach out to me. You can find my email address on the website. You can find all sorts of other contact information on our website. We would love to hear from you. With that, let's get tonight's uh, session started. I will be co-presenting with my friend and colleague, Steve Young. Steve, I'll let you tell the people about you. Well, before we do that, oh, um, yes. one other housekeeping matter, yes. which is we have four programs next summer, oh, and yes. we're looking for ideas, we're looking for speakers, so um, my email is steve.young at kyl.com if you want to speak or ha think you might want to speak or have an idea of something that's always interested you and you'd like researched, um, give us some suggestions so we can get four killer programs next summer. Great. Good. And with that, let's get started. So to warm ourselves <clears throat> up, tonight we're doing a special session called Kwani Believe It or Not. So we're telling four very different brief tales that all have a connection to Quantic and Tug. But boy, these tales couldn't be more different from one another. They're very, very desperate, disparate collection of stories. But to warm you up, we thought we would get some audience participation going. So we've put together the Kwani Believe It or Not quiz. I'm going to present to you five true or false questions. I'll pose the question. If you think it's true, I'll ask you to raise your hand. Now, of course, there are no prizes if you are right or get all of them right other than the satisfaction <laughs> of being correct all the time. So we're going to get started. All right. Come on, are we ready to get started? There we go. All right. Question one. True or false? A two-headed calf was once born in Quantic and Tog. Raise your hand if you think that's true. Raise your hand if you think it's false. Ah, oh, doubters. It is sadly true. A two-headed cow was born on the Crandall farm in August of 1913. And by the way, and I said this when this was presented to the Historical Society uh, last year, once you see this, you cannot unsee it. <laughs> All right, question two. True or false? An Oscar-nominated actor once lived in Quantic and Tug. Is it true? Raise your hands if it's true. Raise your hands if you think it's false. All right, so there are a couple of doubters. It's true. Chester Morris, wasn't who you were thinking. Chester Morris once lived at the Morris Point House. And it was built by his father in 1917. Chester Morris was a prolific stage and film actor. He's probably both best known for his uh, repeated role as criminal turned detective Boston Blackie, uh, which he made from the 40s to the 70s. But he was nominated for an Oscar for his role in Alibi in 1929. A very long career, indeed. All right. True or false? Quantic and Tog is home to carnivorous plants. True. Who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's false? Well, it's not the Audrey II from Little Shop of Horrors, but it's true. Kwani is home to several varieties of carnivorous plants, including pitcher plants, sundews, and bladderworts. They primarily eat invertebrates, uh, which is probably most folks in this room are safe. <laughs> like that? All right. Question four, true or false? 
Aldrich Ames, the CIA analyst who was found to be a KGB mole in the 80s, spent his childhood summers in Quantikintug. True or false? Who says it's true? False, I made this up. <laughs> but what a mugshot. That's a face only a mother could love, and apparently the KGB. <laughs> Last but not least, during Prohibition, rum runners operated on Quanti Pond. True or false? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Mention spirits in Quantic and Tog. And it's not, you're not raising your hand for true or false. You're just, hallelujah. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. They operated throughout the area during Prohibition. There are, they were so numerous in the area, the General Stanton Inn, which at the time was an inn, had to add an extra room to house them. And a frequent guest was Al Capone. All right. You all did splendidly well. I give you all an A+. Plus. All right. With that, now that you're all whooped up into a frenzy, let's start with our first program. What are we starting with? The large one? Coal, right? Coal, coal. I now hand you over to my co-presenter, <clears throat> Steve Young. Thank you. It helps if you point it at the computer when you're clicking. OK. And if it doesn't work, just let me know. All right, good. Maybe if I stand here, I don't want to get too close no, to I that speaker I... and set it off again. So my grandfather put $100 down on a lot in Kwani in 1946. Howard Thorpe took back a promissory note for $100 a month for 14 months, and he bought 150 Surfside uh, in 1946. I came along in 1948, and my whole life I've been coming to Kwani, sometimes only a weekend or a week. Um, in more recent years, we're able to spend May and October uh, here. But I go back a long way at Quantikintog. So one thing we love to do is walk out our front door and walk down to the nun's house. And it's great beach combing. There's great shells. There's lots of animals. There's lots of birds. There's a lot going on. It's such a nice walk. And we all collect kind of different things. Um, so I noticed early on that there's coal on our beach. And I would ask my grandfather, you know, why is there coal on Kwani Beach? It doesn't make any sense to me. You know, the uh, Ice Age and the receding of the, gra of the uh, glaciers and dropping the um, granite it wasn't dropping coal. And how does coal <laughs> get on our beach? So over the years of uh, walking on the beach, I've collected 700, this is maybe 70 pieces of coal. Um, and take a souvenir if you'd like. <laughs> the ocean makes more. But it's rounded, it's smooth, it's black, it's real coal. And how in the hell did it get on our beach? And why our, our grand daughters were here uh, last weekend and we walked down to the nun's house and got 15 pieces of, of coal. So it's, it's been washing in for 100 years or 120 years and I wanted to research where is this coal coming from. And I think I found the answer. I was very sure I found the answer until only a week or so ago when a, a little doubt was uh, cast upon my theory. Let's see, I'll stand here. So I think the answer is, in 1907, there was a horrendous collision in Block Island Channel off of Quantikintog. Yeah, I call it the Titanic of Rhode Island. It's before the Titanic, but we've never had a worse calamity than the collision of the steamship Largemont and the three-masted schooner Harry Knowlton. And it happened on February 11th, 1907, so a long, long time ago. And here are the 
protagonists of this story. The Larchmont was a 252-foot wooden side wheeler. You can see the side wheel on both sides. It was part of the Joy Line. Uh, it had three decks. It was built in Bath, Maine in 1885. It was a wooden uh, steamship. Commodore Vanderbilt made millions building steamships in this uh, era. And it would hold about 200 passengers and crew. And it also was carrying, in February of 1907, a cargo of scrap brass. And we don't know exactly how many passengers it was carrying because the manifest was on the ship, and the ship is at the bottom of the ocean. So they only can estimate uh, the number of people on the Larchmont. So the other protagonist in this story is a three-masted schooner called the Harry Knowlton. And I couldn't find uh, a picture of the Harry Knowlton afloat. <laughs> this is the Harry Knowlton after uh, it crashed into um, the Larchmont. And this is about the best picture that I could uh, get of it. But it had a crew of six men and a captain, a very young captain, probably 24 years old or something like that. And it was carrying 453 tons of coal. And it's got 453 tons of coal in this picture. Uh, so it would be high out of the water and it had four sails and it was quite, uh, quite a vessel. So you have to put yourself back into 1907. And in the, that period, you have to remember, there's no cars, there's no trucks, there's no airplanes, there's some train service. But if you were in Providence and you wanted to go to New York, the best way to go was on a steamship. And you could board a steamship in Providence at 645 in the evening, get a nice cabin with a sleeper and a bunk and then you go to sleep and you wake up in New York in the morning and it was really the way to travel. The alternative was to saddle up the horse or get a wagon and come down the Boston Post Road and it would take forever and it was really difficult traveling. And when I say no trucks, you know, it's not only people moving up and down the coast from New York to Providence to Boston and other places in New England, but it's goods too. All of that went by sea in this period before uh, cars and, and trucks and airplanes. And the channel between Quantocantog and Block Island was really, really busy. There's tons of ships going up and down. So the lighthouse keeper in Narragansett made it his life's work one year to keep account of the ships going past uh, uh, Narragansett into or through you know, Block Island Channel. And he counted 4,444 steamships, 2,100 sloops, 30,000 schooners. So there was a lot of traffic. And this picture kind of captures you know, the, the ferry and the three master and a two, uh, one master and three master there, more, more ships, but there's a lot of traffic. So with a lot of traffic, there's a lot of accidents. And as you might know, or might remember, we did a, pro, uh, we did a program on the life-saving station in Quantocantog that was kind of between the old breachway and the new breachway. And it was a forerunner of the Coast Guard. And it was manned eight months a year by six uniformed uh, surfmen, they called them, who operated a dory. And they were commanded by the keeper. And they would go out. They would go up and down the beach. They would look for boats in trouble. And this is a 
slide from the lady who made the presentation about the Quantic life-saving station and all of the rescues that it made and it saved hundreds or thousands of people. And you'll see in 1907, uh, the Larchmont and the Harry Knowlton were uh, on the list of uh, ships that uh, got in trouble in uh, Block Island Channel. So this is the collision course. So Providence is up here. You board the ship at 645, the steamship, and you're basically going west through Block Island Channel between Quantic and Tog and Block Island. And that's the Larchmont. The Harry Knowlton, the three-masted schooner with 453 tons of coal had just loaded at a coal dock in South Amboy, New Jersey, bound for Boston. And it was coming up the channel uh, eastbound. And the weather that night couldn't possibly have been worse. It's about zero degrees. It's February. It's 1907. The seas are 10 to 20 foot seas. The wind is blowing 40 knots. It's dark and very cold and very inhospitable. And here's a map of where the collision happened. The red dot, kind of off Watch Hill. Here's Block Island, here's Quantiquantog, and that's where the collision happened. So it's a winter gale, and the Largemont is going uh, west, and the Harry Knowlton T-bones it right behind the side wheeler in the soft belly of the boat, and it's a wooden boat, and the Harry Knowlton had 453 tons of coal in it, and it's all of its sails out, and it was going like mad, and it rammed the Largemont and put a hole in it where the Largemont, I've seen one estimate where it said it sunk in 15 minutes and one estimate where it's, they said it sunk in 12 minutes. So it is a freaking disaster because people are in their beds, they're in their night clothes, there's, you know, 200 souls on board. The weather is awful. The seas are high. The wind is blowing. And uh, the Larchmont is in really big trouble and uh, is sinking and, and sinking fast. And that Harry Knoll, and the wind is blowing out of the northwest. So in one way, that's a blessing because if you're adrift, or you're in a lifeboat, or you're on a piece of decking that uh, broke off, the wind is going to blow you to Block Island. And that's what happened. It was just kind of dumb luck that people from the Largemont ended up in Block Island, but unfortunately most of them ended up in Block Island as popsicles. Um, they were frozen uh, and came ashore over the next uh, week or two. There was only time on the Largemont to launch three of its lifeboats. And most people drowned, never came above deck. The ship sank to the bottom, and they drowned. Others froze to death. You couldn't be in these conditions very long without really, really, really bad suffering and hypothermia and frostbite. Um, and this is a artist's rendering of the Largemont sinking and you can see its side wheel. So the Largemont had about 200 souls on it between crew and passengers and this is a list of the survivors. And there were only 19 people that survived uh, this collision. So you can see why they call it the Titanic of Rhode Island, because it was a real killer. And embarrassingly, 10 of the survivors are crew members, including the captain and the officers. 
Only nine passengers lived. Hopefully there's no descendants of that crew, but I think the captain's supposed to be the last one off the ship, and I think he was the first one off the ship. Um, and he lived, but only nine passengers lived. And one of the lifeboats uh, came to Block Island the next day and had aboard, uh, let me find his name, Oliver Hanvier of Providence, a passenger. And he was the only one alive in his uh, lifeboat. Everyone else was dead. Um, they froze to death. They were not dressed for it. It was cold. It they were wet. It was icy. And they were suffering terribly. And he lived and he brought the lifeboat, you know, into Block Island. And the New York Times carried this very closely and in detail because there were some important people on, on the ship and it was an interesting story. So there's lots of New York Times articles day after day after day about the Larchmont and the Harry Knowlton sinking. So the New York Times reporter interviews Oliver Hanvier and he tells the New York Times that I've never been in such terror before. The waves were so big, it was so dark, we had no idea where we were going. We were adrift, it was freezing, and people were dying left and right on the boat. And two of the passengers decided that a better death was to cut their own throats. And two of them cut their throat rather than freezing to death. And uh, Oliver Hanvier tells this story to the New York, New York Times. So bodies are washing up on Block Island. They're collected in wagons. And uh, you know the few survivors uh, also made it to Block Island. And so many of them ended up losing fingers, toes, arms to frostbite and amputation. Uh, and people had much shorter uh, lives you know, that were on or went through this terrible ordeal. So the Harry Knowlton had a different strategy, and the Harry Knowlton strategy worked. Well, I guess it had, a it had a choice, and it took the right choice. And that young captain basically told his crew of six that when they T-boned the Larchmont, because of the waves, it pulled away. And he basically gave the command to head for Rhode Island shore and keep the sails up and we're going to beat like hell to Rhode Island and see if we can run this thing aground because there's no alternative and we've got a hole in our bow and we're sinking. So that crew operated the pumps and kept the Harry Knowlton afloat with 453 tons of coal in its belly and it got you know, within a half a mile or so of Weekapog Beach, they were hoping to get to the Quantiquantog life-saving station. This is an old postcard that I think is after the fact because the life-saving station didn't really play any role in saving anybody. Um, but the crew all lived, the captain lived, and here's a staged picture. You know, nobody had a camera in 1907, so a lot of the pictures that we have are postcards, and the postcard business was huge. If you wanted to memorialize your uh, Quantic and Tog vacation, you bought a penny postcard. And uh, so this is a stage picture of the rough crew of the uh, Harry Knowlton and the captain, uh, who looks older than he's supposed to be. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, maybe he aged quickly. So the Harry Knowlton was wood, and it got beat to a pulp in the waves, and it's you know disintegrated, and there's no wreck to find anymore. But it was you know pretty much intact for a month or so in 1907 uh, in the surf, and it would 
wash closer and closer to shore. This is a postcard that I came across about the wreck of the Harry Knowlton. And although they get the date a little bit wrong, it's the 11th, not the 12th, uh, this person writes, the surf has broken it up. It was stripped by a wrecking company before it went to pieces. So all the sails were gone, all the rigging was gone, all the fixtures were gone. Um, and I guess the question is, is coal a valuable enough commodity in 1907 where they tried to salvage the coal? It wouldn't have been an easy salvage job, but this looks to me like a barge is pulled up, you know, near the remains of the Harry Knowlton. And although it's been stripped and uh, wreckers have uh, uh, worked on it for quite a while, maybe they were able to salvage some of the coal. But I think when we are walking along our beaches and come across coal, the most likely story is it came from the Harry Knowlton and is washing around. I was pretty sure I had this figured out and then I went back and looked at that life-saving video on our website, life-saving station video on our website and she uh, had some uh, interesting ideas and theories and references and I kind of followed them and I discovered, well before I get there, um, so this is a month after the calamity and the news article is uh, the Harry Knowlton is sold for $28. Um, you know, after the last line, the schooner has been stripped of her sails, rigging, and fixtures by wreckers, but somebody paid $28 for it and maybe they recovered some of the coal, I don't know. It would have been a hard recovery, I would think, of probably a low-priced uh, commodity, but so just as I think I've got this figured out, I come across a wreck that the lady from the Life Saving Station uh, talk gave about the barge banquet, uh, or bouquet. And in 1906, there was a ocean-going tug carrying five fully laden barges full of coal, and they were connected by a hauser uh, from, bar from tug to barge to barge to barge to barge to barge. The last barge was the bouquet. And the bouquet was taking on water while it had tons of coal in it. And it broke at the hauser and sank. And it's supposed to be uh, two to four miles off of Quantiquantog, but it's in 130 feet of water, and it could be a source, I guess, of some coal on our beach, but I think the Harry Knowlton's a, a more likely story. I won't take your time to tell you about the John Wyman because that turned out to be a dead end because those barges were coming the other way from Boston empty and crashed, so that couldn't spill. But then my colleague, Mr. Uh, Steinman, reminded me of his story if you saw the last uh, presentation he made, which is the Nazis are defeated, they call a truce, but the U-boat 853 is lurking off of Block Island. And whether they didn't get the message or that captain said, screw them, I'm going <laughs> to keep shooting, <laughs> he went after the merchant ship the Black Point, and he torpedoed it on May 5th after the war, after the uh, Nazis had surrendered, and he sank the Black Point three and three quarters miles southeast of Point Judith, uh, but in 150 feet of water, and that was carrying way, 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 way more coal than the Harry Knowlton. But again, my common sense tells me that's probably not the source of the coal on our beach because it's in 150 feet of water and it's in a steel ship and probably 
blown open, but uh, pretty doubtful, I think. So this is an artist sketch of that terrible uh, collision, the Titanic of Rhode Island launching the lifeboat, the Larchmont sinking, the Harry Knowlton pulling away, and I think that's the explanation for why we find coal on the beach in Quantikantab. Thank you. Remember how I said at the beginning this was going to be a lighthearted presentation? Yeah, clearly not. Uh, but let's, let's change it up a little bit uh, because I too later will tell you a story of sadness and tragedy, but not yet. Let's talk about Thomas Edison in Quantic and Talk. I know everybody's so excited, right? All right. Thomas Edison, between September 1881 and January of 1883, Thomas Edison operated an ore, iron ore extraction facility right here in Quantic and Talk. Now, at the time, Edison, who was in his 30s, was already a famous inventor. He didn't invent the light bulb, but he certainly took it to a whole other level of usability. He was famous for that. He didn't invent the telegraph machine, but he invented the automatic telegraph machine, which made sending large telegraphs uh, much faster. Uh, so he was already famous. And he spent some time in the summers on Long Island, and in particular in a town called Quag. Now, he noticed that the beach in Quag had a lot of quote unquote black sand, and Edison figured out it was iron. So he starts to think about how he can take this iron, which of course is a valuable commodity. At the time, the general view was that mines in the eastern part of the United States were approaching depletion and that there had to be other creative ways of finding iron ore in large quantities. And of course, we're right in the midst uh, of a great industrial explosion here in the United States. Uh, and so iron is at a premium. So Edison says to himself, how can I separate this black sand, which is essentially largely iron, from the rest of the silica-based sand that we see on the beaches. So he creates in early 1880 and then ultimately files a patent and gets a patent for it in June of 1880, the magnetic ore separator. And he takes this machine, which I'll explain to you in a minute, to quag as a test bed for whether he can separate iron sand from regular sand and then do something useful with the iron. To make the Edison magnetic ore separator work, you need three things. First of all, you need a steam engine. And Edison used Baxter steam engines. You need a dynamo, which is essentially a motor that generates electricity. And of course, you need the Edison ore separator. And you put all these things together. The steam engine powers the dynamo. The dynamo generates electricity and sends it to the magnet in the ore separator. Right? So engine, power, magnet, or electricity, magnet. All right. But how did the amazing Edison ore separator really work? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> First of all, boys and girls, you need to apply electricity to the giant electromagnet which that finger is pointing to. Then you fill a hopper full of sand. You've dried the sand, because of course sand is kind of damp when you shovel it off the beach and it's clumpy. So first you dry it, right? And then you pour it into a hopper. You open the hopper and the sand pours down. And then you turn on the magnet. And the magnet pulls the iron-bearing sand to the left, and the regular boring old sand falls to the right. And of course, your hopper, or your bin at the bottom, is separated, so you get the nice iron filings here. And then you just get the old sand there. 
hurrah. Now, the test at Quag is wildly successful insofar as it generates lots and lots of piles of fine iron particulates, essentially iron sand. And Edison is thrilled. And so he sends several of his employees to look for other sources of black sand, iron bearing sand, throughout New England. Actually, they went as far up as Canada, but they focus on New England. They look on Martha's Vineyard, no good. They look on Nantucket, no good. They look at Fisher's Island, nothing. But then they come to Quanicantog, and they discover that the beaches in Quanicantog are full of iron bearing black sand. So Edison, having gotten this report, disp dispatches one of his employees, a fellow by the name of Cheese Man, I love that, to, rent, to lease 1.5 miles of beach. And this, it's hard to read, but this is from the original minute books of the Edison Ore Milling Company, a company set up for this crazy venture. And Cheese Man, Cheese Man's not a New Englander. So Cheese Man discovers that 1.5 miles of beach is hard to rent from Yankees. <laughs> he ultimately secures three quarters of a mile of beach and notes to the board of the Edison Company that it was after some effort. <laughs> of course it was. Welcome to New England. So he enters into, or the Edison Company, a trustee of one of Edison's companies on behalf of the iron extraction company, enters into a lease with Sophia Pendleton. For those of you familiar with the ubiquitous Palmer Pendleton, right? This is his grandmother. And they lease uh, three quarters of a mile of beach for $25 a year for three years. And the lease is very clear. There is no right to the seaweed, and they will not interfere with the collection of seaweed. Who knows why? Farmers, it's fertilizer, exactly, exactly. And here actually we can see this is a page from the original, uh, one of the two copies of the original lease, handwritten. The Edison Company got one and the Pendletons got the other. Now this was big news, right? Edison, I mean he hasn't invented uh, the phonograph, he hasn't gotten involved in movies yet, he's still in his early 30s, but he is newsworthy. And so the local press picks up on the fact that his company has leased land here in South County. And the Westerly Weekly carries a, several stories actually about it. This is the first one. They note that the Sheffield farm at Quanicantog, note the spelling of Quanicantog back in the day, is said to have been let to the Edison Light Company. That, of course, was kind of accurate. It was a different Edison company for the purpose of mining the black sand which is found there. It was such big news that even the city folks up in Providence read about it. The Edison Ore Co. of New York has leased Quanicantog Beach and is erecting buildings for the milling of black sand. And then finally, as the facility gets up and running, a few months later, the Westerly Weekly reports again that the Edison Ore Milling Company, they got it right this time, has taken machinery to Quanicantog Beach for the purpose of, quote, milling the black sand found there on the Captain Pendleton Beach. So this raises an interesting question. And it's a bit of a mystery. People have all sorts of theories about where exactly the Edison Ore Milling Company was set up. Well, if you look at the Pendleton lease and you look at these news articles and then you look at the status of property ownership in Quantic and Tog in 1881, we can figure out approximately where that three quarters of a mile of beach was located. And here's where we, here I'll walk you through it. So here's Quantic and Tog, circa 1881, mapped by yours truly. Here we see 
Uh, the Pendleton Farmhouse, which of course is on West Beach Road. It's owned by Captain and Sophia Pendleton. She, of course, was a Sheffield mm -hmm. and a Pendleton uh, by marriage. To the east, uh, I'm sorry, to the west, Thomas Barber at that time had already purchased what is, would become known as the Ashaway Colony. It's where the nuns retreat is now. By the time Edison's company arrives here, these lots have already been split up by Thomas Barber, who brought them from the Babcock family, and he had already sold them off to the folks who built summer homes in the Ashaway colony. Well, so we know what the western boundary of the possible location of the ore separation facility was. It wasn't set up right in front of the fancy homes being built at the Ashaway Colony. Well, where was it bounded potentially on the east? Well, Billings Macomber owned all of this property in what is now East Beach, and he had yet to subdivide the lots. He owned to about the middle of West Pond. He had yet to subdivide the lots and turn them into lots for cottages. So this was part of Billings Macomber's farm. So that means the beach that was owned by Ethan and Sophia Pendleton was essentially the beach in front of what we consider Central Beach. This is Captain Pendleton's beach. So somewhere here in Central Beach, Edison had his facility. And the facility was pretty meager. It consisted of two buildings, one where they dried the sand, and then the other where the Edison ore separation machine was located. They were wooden structures. So that's generally where we know the facility was set up. Now it was a success. Once they get up and running here at Quantic and Tog, they are milling seven to 10 tons of iron a day out of our beach. So it's a success, right? Another brilliant idea brought to you by Thomas Edison. Except there's a couple of problems. Problem one, transportation was unreliable. We don't have a harbor here in Quantic and Tug. Transportation to the nearest railroad station was in Westerly over sand track roads. Right? And they're generating a tremendous amount of ore. So they try to convince schooner captains, who we later learned, who we've learned earlier is quite a dangerous bunch. <laughs> they convince schooner captains to come in close to Quantic and Tog Beach, but the captains will only bring their schooners close if the winds are blowing right so they don't get stuck. But they manage to transport it out in boats to schooners. But it's not a great system. Here's the other problem. They had one customer in Poughkeepsie that bought a whole lot of sand, or uh, iron sand, once. The Poughkeepsie Ironwork went out of business, not because they bought iron from, from Edison, certainly, but they really were relying on this one customer. And no other customers could be found. They went to foundries up and down the East Coast, and they were all hesitant to take the black sand because most of these ore smelting facilities right, were used to handling big chunks of iron. And this stuff was very fine and particulate, and they were a little suspicious of it. So Edison's people ran all over up and down the East Coast, and they could not find a second customer. So alas, poor Thomas. <laughs> met with a significant failure. And this is a great quote from the Minute Books. Edison was the primary shareholder. He had a board of directors. And this is the quote from when the board decides to wind up the company. It is not without a feeling of regret, which is, by the way, the most passive way to put that, that your board has felt obligated to cease operations in Quantic and Tog without having at least realized enough from the sale of ore to pay back the money invested. In other words, we ran at a loss and we're broke. So what did they do? They took apart everything 
First of all, Edison took the or the, mag, the ma marvelous magnetic ore separator machine, took it back. That was a valuable piece of intellectual property. Everything else is sold locally. The buildings, the two buildings, are broken up for lumber, right? The steam engine, they also take the dynamos back, the electrical engine, but the steam engine is sold locally and at a bargain price. This is a telegram to John Beebe, who at the time was the facility manager, telling him, sell the steam engine for 400 bucks. A year before, the value of the steam engine was reflected on their books for $800. And if you look at advertisements in this period, from the Baxter Steam Engine Company, the retail value of an eight horsepower engine like the one they had here, a thousand bucks. So stuff was bought at a bargain price. Edison, however, won't let the idea go. He ultimately moves the ore separation business to New Jersey, right where he had uh, his headquarters, and continued to build magnetic devices to separate iron from surrounding dirt, rock, etc., but on a much larger scale. So he started working with a local mine in New Jersey. They were bringing in tons and tons of stuff. Ultimately, Edison sells all of his shares in the newly formed General Electric, which was about $1.5 million then about $400 million now. He sold all of his stock in General Electric to invest it in separating iron from rock and sand using magnets. He lost it all. A few years later, probably around 1888, the entire venture is broke. They declare bankruptcy. And Edison, ever the optimist, has a great quote about it. Well, it's all gone, but we had a hell of a good time spending it. All right, what's next? Fire engine of Quantico Fire Tower. engine. See, nobody, nobody's turning. Thank you. <laughs> this is one of two presentations this evening without mass loss of life, popsicle <laughs> humans, and the like. I hand the wand to you, Maestro. Thank you, sir. Good job. What do you have? So, how many of you remember the Quantic fire engine? I would think even more. Hmm. Okay. Well, the Quantic and Tog, here's the story of the Quantic and Tog fire engine and how I became interested in it. So, in the fall of 1954, uh, my grandfather, Dick Moran, had an idea. Uh, they had formed the uh, Central Beach Fire District as the governing body and here was a fire district with no fire engine. So my grandfather started looking for a fire truck to buy and he bought one and the way that I became interested in this subject is my grandmother for 50 years kept a diary. And some weeks are busy, some weeks aren't busy. This is October of 1954. And you can see they lived in Norwich but had a house in Quantikentog. And it says, Dick went to the beach, bought a fire engine in Lyme for $300. <laughs> And then she writes in December in her diary, bought a new fire engine in Lyme, Connecticut. So I thought, man, I never knew that. I remember the Quantic and Tog fire engine uh, and being in the 4th of July parades for decades, but I didn't know my grandparents had anything to do with the uh, fire engine. But my grandfather was the negotiator and uh, bought the fire engine from Old Lime. So this is the 1928 Maxim pumper that he bought from Old Lime. It had served Old Lime for 26 years and Old Lime then bought a brand new 
uh, fire engine and wanted to get rid of the Maxim. And this is a picture uh, on Ninigrit at the corner of uh, Surfside and Ninigrit in front of our, the side of our house. I think the roads were uh, uh, not paved in 1954, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I know the Hurtados lived in this house and that's gone. R Rusty Roof has a house there and I think these two houses uh, are gone too. They would be on Ocean View. Uh, the fellow with the hose is my grandfather. The first, uh, the, lo the lower level lady standing up on the running board is my grandmother and their friends John and Alice McCormick who lived on East Beach uh, at Sea Seabreeze and Midland, uh, they're driving the truck. And there was a builder in town by the name of Brad Fisher and he built our house and built a dozen houses or more in Quantiquantog and that's his son David. And I'm sure Brad is probably taking the picture because Brad was a tinkerer and knew engines and could keep things running and had a barn or something to keep the fire engine so he was probably in charge of, in the very early days of keeping uh, the fire engine in, in shape. So this is 1954, a $300 uh, purchase and it says old lime on it still. So my grandfather who didn't know one end of a screwdriver from another <laughs> and wasn't at all <laughs> handy, here is him in a dirt road in Quantiquantog. Uh, with the fire chief hat number two, a rubber <laughs> raincoat, and boots. And we had dinner with Kathy and Bob Frazier uh, this week. And Kathy's father, uh, Bill Carpenter Sr., Billy Carpenter's father and Kathy Frazier's father, uh, kind of took over for Brad Fisher at one point in time to keep the fire engine running because, you know, every July 4th we had to fire it up because it needed to be in the parade. So she, said, she saw this picture and there's a picture of her that, she will, that I will show you and she said, oh, come home and I want to show you something. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, that's fantastic. This is number two. Oh, that's great. This is the fire hat from 1954. You oh, pass it great. around, it's got a crack in it, but it's heavy and uh, that's the original. So Bill, Bill, I should say, knows cars and trucks and refurbishing and has an interest in fire engines. So he's going to do some of the restoration part of this. Thanks, Steve. Well, the Ma Maxim is a New England company. It was founded in 1914 by Carlton Maxim. There's the old factory. Who was Carlton Maxim? Well, he was the Middletown, Massachusetts fire chief. And in the early part of the 20th century, he was responsible for purchasing a new fire truck for his fire company. And he was completely dissatisfied with what was out there in the market. Now, he owned a car dealership and he was very mechanical. And he knew he could build a better engine. And in fact, he could. So he started to build fire trucks. And the one that lived here in Quantiquantog was actually a very common model for the Maxim Fire Company. It cost approximately $8,800 when new, which is about $158,000 in today's dollars, which, by the way, is a bargain for a fire truck. <laughs> Municipalities spend upwards uh, into the millions for new fire trucks. And the Maxim Pumper was really popular, particularly in New England, and then gradually over the course of the 20th century, they expanded west. But a whole lot of fire departments in and around southern New England had Maxim pumpers just like ours. And a fun little fact before I give everything back to Steve, the Maxim company went out of business sometime in the early to mid 80s. 
And it was, the name was purchased by a company uh, just across the border in Massachusetts called Greenwood Emergency Vehicles. Greenwood was owned by a Quantic and Tog resident, Tim O'Neill. If you know Tim and Jean O'Neill, they have the very tall house on the dingle. Tim bought the name and started building Maxim fire trucks again. Sadly, Tim could not be here. So back to you, sir. So these will bring back memories to some people. So starting in the late 1950s, the Quantic and Tog fire engine turned out for the 4th of July parade every year. Uh, they would kind of muster at the ball field, either at the beginning or the end. And here's an old picture that we were able to find. And I'm not 100% sure, but I would bet that the man with the cane is Al Randall. Uh, does that sound right? So he, here's a great picture, uh, probably from the early 1960s. And this is Bill Carpenter Sr. at the wheel. And he was responsible for a long time keeping the fire engine going. And the man in the top hat is Grant Slater. And my grandfather is the fellow with the ball cap on the, on the back. Uh, they tell me it's Matt Wagner between the two young girls. And one of the young girls on the left is Kathy Frazier, who now lives at 140 or 130 Surfside. And came over to dinner. and. You can see she's wearing fire hat number two. <laughs> and had sticky fingers and kept it for <laughs> 50 years. And I'm not sure who the other man is in the, in the foreground. Does anyone know? So these are the Randall girls. And I believe that's Brad Fisher at the wheel. <laughs> and this is a picture where Brad Fisher is driving. And I believe Jared Bradley's father, Dr. Bradley, uh, Bill Bradley, is the fellow uh, with the pipe uh, manning the ladders, turning the corner at Ocean View and uh, Ninigrit. Yep. And our flagpole. <laughs> and I'm not sure who the young lady is. Does anyone know who the young lady is? I'm not sure. Here's a picture of Bob Frost and Bill Bradley and Meg, I believe, on the fire engine sometime in the 1970s. Does that sound right? Meg Frost. So we got the fire engine in 1954. By 19, I'm not sure, 82 or so, it just wouldn't turn to for the parade anymore. And Bob Frost uh, uh, bought the fire engine and kept it, I think, in the East West Farm barn for a number of years. And I think it just sat there from roughly 1982 until August 18th, 1988, when Bob and Whitney uh, Frost uh, made a deal with Old Lime to have the circle of life completed, where the fire engine starts in Old Lime for 26 years comes to Quantic and Tog for 34 years, and then goes back to Old Lyme. And it was in pretty rough shape. Uh, it was a 50 or 60 year old fire engine then, and then been kept in a lot of barns. But you can see the name uh, Ellis Jewett. Uh, and uh, it says a year after Ellis Jewett's grandfather retired from his post at, as Old Lyme's First fire chief, the town bought a brand new fire engine. And anyway, this is when they bought the new fire engine, they didn't need uh, the, the other one. So they bought a new one. And now they're buying it back. And when my, where I live in California, and when I, my wife and I came to 
New York, we came up 95 and I said to Marlene, let's get off at Old Lyme and see if we can find the fire engine. Because uh, Whitney and I had been in touch and she had told me that that's where it resided. So I found the fire department, but it was all locked up. It's all volunteers and I looked in the windows hoping to find the fire engine, but couldn't find it. So I went to town hall and spoke to the manager and then he referred me to the fire marshal and the fire marshal referred me to Mike McCarthy and Mike McCarthy said, oh, you need to speak with Ellis Jewett. So I spoke to Ellis Jewett and this is Ellis Jewett and he was a fire chief in Old Lyme his, for five years. His father was volunteer fire chief before him and his grandfather, Dr. Jewett was fire chief before him. So fire engines and Old Lyme volunteer fire department is in his blood and he was striking, he was, or meeting him was like striking gold. I mean, he was so eager to tell us about the fire engine and tell us about the remodel and he was, it all happened in his driveway and his barn. So from 1988, to 1998, the fire engine uh, was at Ellis Jewett's barn and for three or four of those years they had a commission where they were going to have their 75th anniversary as a fire department and the goal was to have the Maxim 1928 restored by then for the parade for the 75th year and they made it but every Tuesday night for three or four years the committee met and I will turn it over to Bill to talk about the remodel. Well, so there it is now in all of its glory. This is a picture from the 75th anniversary parade. Um, that could be Ellis right there. I'm not sure if that's him or not. Um, but uh, Steve. Uh, and Richie, you went as Richie well. Richie Thompson Richie and Thompson. I went on Monday. Monday, I was unable to join them. I'm very jealous. Uh, and went and visited Old Number One back in Old Lyme and got to see just the amount of work and the level of detail that went into restoring it. They completed what's known in the crazy old car guy business as a frame off restoration. That means they essentially took the thing down to its frame. They took the body where everybody sits and all the equipment is off the frame, took all of the rust, all of the dirt, all of the grime off, resurfaced everything, repaired everything, and put it all back together. All of the surfaces were re-nickeled. This was before cars had chrome, so they were resurfaced with nickel. Um, everything was repainted. Uh, you see, they, Ellis said that they had somebody in the group who was in the pump business. Pump business and somebody who had a plating company, which was a big help and saved them a fortune. And I love the picture on the left because if you see the, where it says 1928, you see the crank right below that. Um, and it does have an electric starter now, but uh, originally in 1928, you cranked it to uh, fire it up for the fire. You see the hood ornament with the, uh, uh, shows you the pressure from the radiator. And, and yep. Hand cranked siren, you had said, yes. all rebuilt. There's Richie Thompson lurking in the background. <laughs> trying to get the spotlight. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and I like this picture because Ellis Jewett said, well, as a career, I was a shop teacher and I was good with wood. And when you see, or the com condition of the fire engine was terrible when he got it. So the seats were toxic. I mean, they were so dilapidated. So he made a new oak frame and went to a town uh, refurbisher or uh, upholsterer and got the new seats looking great and the driver of course would be on the left riding shotgun the job of that guy was to crank the siren manually and ring the bell with the other hand. <laughs> 
I could not do that. <laughs> I can't rub my belly. All the nickel plating. They told, they told a great story about the ladder, how they couldn't, you said, they couldn't find a ladder, an original ladder that fit. Right, so the, uh, it didn't come back to them with a ladder, so they bought a ladder, but it was too wide to fit in the bracket, so they cut two or three inches off of each spoke and put the ladder together again so it would fit. Uh, so, and you know, the paint job is fabulous and the gold leaf job is fabulous. Uh, he told a story of trying to get a Maxim fire extinguisher and they found one and the committee of four or five guys went to buy it and the guy wanted an astronomical price to get a real Maxim fire extinguisher. So they all pulled out their wallets and counted up all the money that they had and offered it to him and he said no. So <laughs> that's not a Maxim fire extinguisher. <laughs> Period, correct, but not what it would have had from the factory. Right. And just so you know, you know, when you restore a vehicle like this, you can certainly use um, power tools to do some of the polishing, but not all of it. So this high shine, when you spray paint on an automobile you're restoring, it doesn't come out looking shiny like that. It's got kind of a, a pebbly pattern like we call it orange peel. That was all hand rubbed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. Ellis told me on the running board when it came from Kwani there was a, a wooden cone on the running board and what that was for was the old bucket brigade. So the buckets would be turned upside down, put on the cone, they were conical shapes so you could put another bucket, another bucket, another bucket on and uh, that was the bucket brigade in 1928. And you had said that it could only handle about 200 gallons worth yeah. of water. So the, the water is all in that tank and I don't know if that's a 100 gallon no, tank or... Oh, was the lower tank? Oh. But oh. still, 200 gallons is not a lot. So the lesson is, in 1928, do not have a house fire. <laughs> in old Lyme where there's no fire hydrants. <laughs> right, exactly. So this is the end. This is uh, engine number one doing the full circle of life and back renewed and giving the people of Old Lyme a lot of uh, pleasure in, in parades. All right, our last presentation of the evening is another uplifting <laughs> story. We wanted to end on just a note of positivity. <laughs> All right, now, before I start, a couple of warnings. First and foremost, the Hindenburg, which does have a connection to Quanakintog, as you will soon see, was operated at a time when the Nazis obviously controlled Germany. They put swastikas on everything. I opted not to block them out on the pictures, so just a fair warning, there are some swastikas in this presentation. The other warning, this story does not end well in case you do not know that. <laughs> Zeppelins used to fly over Quanakintog. This is a photograph, you can see the old school Quani telephone pole. This photograph was taken, I'm not sure if it was taken on East Beach or Central Beach, it doesn't say where or who took it, but this is a picture of the Hindenburg taken from Quantic and Tog in 1936, its first full year of operation. The Hindenburg made 17 flights over South County between 1936 and 1937. And here's another great shot, Rich Wells, got this to me. You can see that's the Ashaway group uh, and there is the nun's house which of course at the time would have been the Quantic and Tug Inn. I think this is my favorite picture in all mm -hmm. of the Historical Society's archives. This is just unbelievable. And then the Hindenburg in 1936 
was big news. And whenever the Hindenburg passed over a location, all of the local newspapers would either carry stories telling residents where they could see it, or after it passed over, it told you you could have seen it, but you probably didn't. <laughs> so here we go, August 21st, 1936. It's first full year of operation carrying passengers between Frankfurt, Germany, and Lakehurst, New Jersey. Residents of Narragansett and persons in the southern part of Kingstown. If you were in the northern part of Kingstown, you were out of luck. They were able to get a view of the big airship going by. Now, when they say big airship, they're not kidding. We've all seen photographs of the Hindenburg. We've seen certain films that may have been taken of a particularly noteworthy part of the Hindenburg's career. But it's hard to get an idea for how big the darn thing is. The Hindenburg and its sister ship, the Graf Zeppelin, are the largest aircraft ever built. It's about three and a half times the length of a 747. This is a picture of the Hindenburg on the ground in Germany. This gives you an idea of the scale of just how massive this thing was. And it was wicked expensive to fly on the Hindenburg. In 1936, the Hindenburg's primary competitor for transatlantic crossings was the new, relatively new Queen Mary, which of course now lives near, near you. Long Beach. Indeed. It cost 102 pounds, which in today's dollars is about $11,000 on a round trip from Southampton to New York on the Queen Mary. Now, for that money, you got a three-room suite, a bathroom with, a, with your own facilities, a tub, a shower, a sitting room, a bedroom. The Hindenburg was $720, which today is the equivalent of $15,500 for a round trip. And what did you get on the Hindenburg? That price is not for the whole room that guy is standing in. It's for one of the bunks. And if you weren't traveling with a companion, you made a new friend. <laughs> now, the Hindenburg in its first year could carry about 50 passengers. In its second year, they expanded to 70 passengers. There were four passenger toilets on the Hindenburg, two for men, Two for Damen, two for Herren. <laughs> and one shower, which was described by one Hindenburg passenger as the equivalent of taking a flat bottle of seltzer and shaking it <laughs> over yourself. <laughs> so things were pretty cramped on the Hindenburg, but it was fast. Two days to Europe. And Zeppelin travel was the fastest way to get to Europe in 1936 or 1937. Pan Am had not yet started transatlantic travel. So the Hindenburg was a big deal. And I kind of think, right, the amenities were pretty cool. This is the dining room on the port side of the Hindenburg. I didn't include the menu, but the food was absolutely outrageously luxurious. These windows, of course, look out. So you're on the bottom of the ship. On the starboard side was the lounge and the writing room, because of course people wrote letters then, probably writing letters that said, I'm on the Hindenburg. And my favorite part, this is all on A deck. B deck, which was the second level, you cannot make this up. There was a smoking lounge on the Hindenburg. <laughs> I kid you not. It had an airlock and positive pressure so that hydrogen, which is what created lift on the Hindenburg, couldn't leach into the smoking lounge. And there was a guard stationed there. And there was only one device in the bar or in the smoking lounge that could light your cigarette, your pipe, your cigar. And it was, um, it was a, 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 a hot electrical, like an element on a stove. It wasn't an open flame. You cannot make this stuff up. Now, the Hindenburg has a first year of operation in 1936. She completes a number of transatlantic journeys 
from Germany to the United States, most of them passing over Quantikentog. She also makes some trips to Brazil and back, presumably prepping Brazil to receive Nazis at the end of the Second World War. <laughs> Uh, in 1937, the season starts anew, and the Hindenburg makes its first transatlantic crossing on May 6, 1937. Here is a picture taken of the Hindenburg. It was a relatively foggy day, and this was taken, you can see it says Charlestown Pond, which of course is what we, now, we would now call Nenegrit Pond. So she's making her way down the coast to landing in Lakehurst, New Jersey. Here she is over westerly, still kind of a foggy day. And what is perhaps one of the coolest pictures in South County, there's the Hindenburg slightly shrouded by fog above the westerly public library. Now, on May 6, 1937, the Hindenburg continues to move down the coast of New England towards New York ultimately going to land in Lakehurst, New Jersey, which at the time was a Zeppelin port. Unfortunately, there are thunderstorms over Lakehurst, New Jersey. And of course, the Hindenburg is carrying uh, millions of cubic feet of highly flammable hydrogen. So the Hindenburg circles over New York for about three hours. Ultimately, they decide the weather has cleared enough and they're going to bring the Hindenburg into Lakehurst, New Jersey. She's running late. There are people on the ground who are getting ready to board the Hindenburg, fly to Germany. So, but they start to have a little trouble. The Hindenburg, for whatever reason, is a little tail heavy, so they start to drop ballast and they still can't bring the ship down successfully. So they decide to drop ropes. The way these things landed is they would drop ropes to cruise on the ground and stick it in a giant electrical winch and bring it down to the ground. They dropped ropes much at a much higher altitude than was standard operating procedure for a Zeppelin. Ideally, they wanted to drop ropes uh, within 50, 100 feet. They dropped ropes at about 200 plus feet. Why was the difference important? Because there are different levels of ionic charge in the atmosphere, whether you're at 200 feet or whether you're close to the ground. So they drop ropes, they've grounded out the Zeppelin, and what does that create? Static electricity. So at about 725 on May the 6th, 1937, the Hindenburg explodes. The ship is destroyed in about 30 seconds. Miraculously, of the 97 people on board, 62 survived, and not all of them jumped, as this photo shows. I told you we were going to end on an uplifting, <laughs> uplifting note. And that was the end of lighter than air travel. The Hindenburg sister ship was uh, en route to or coming back from Brazil, the Graf Zeppelin. They heard about the accident, told no one, proceeded to port, and they grounded the airship. Obviously, the Hindenburg was grounded for good. Uh, and that was the end of lighter than air travel. But for that brief, wondrous period, this miraculous way of traveling was a frequent visitor to Quantikentog skies. Now, just as an aside, there's some great Rhode Island stories you can tell about this. I found the Providence Journal article from the day after uh, the Hindenburg disaster. And of course, the top, is the, that famous picture or other famous pictures. And then the rest of the below the fold stories are about the three Rhode Islanders who had tickets to take the Hindenburg to Germany and now had to find alternate transportation. <laughs> the other big story in the Providence Journal was that uh, a Pawtucket fella had taken the Hindenburg to Germany and was going to take it back, and now he was stuck and had to find. These, these were the important parts of the Hindenburg story. Um, uh, very quickly, a quick quiz. A quick quiz. Why did the Hindenburg use highly flammable hydrogen 
instead of the alternative, which is not flammable, helium. Who knows why? Raise your hand if you know why. It does, but that's not the reason. But that's a great guess, Ken. Anybody, any idea? The Helium Control Act of 1925, which was amended in 1927. What at the time, and actually still today, is the world's main source, what country, of helium? The United States. And the United States decided in the 20s to ban the export of helium without presidential approval. Now, I had always heard that the export of helium to Germany was prohibited because we were worried the Nazis were developing weapons and they were going to do all sorts of naughty stuff with it. Predates the rise of the Nazis in Germany. It was a competitive issue. The airlines, air travel in the United States, companies focused on long distance air travel were focusing on aircraft, right? Airplanes with engines like we fly today. In Germany and in other countries, they were focusing on lighter than air travel. And the, the nascent US airline industry lobbied Congress to prohibit the export of helium because they thought it would give Zeppelins an edge above air travel. So it was just for competitive reasons. Roosevelt wanted to authorize the sale of helium, but he was convinced by his cabinet not to, so the Germans redesigned the Hindenburg to travel with hydrogen. Not a great idea. <laughs> Questions and comments about any of our presentations this evening? Well, thank you all so much, Steve. Thank you for including me in this marvelous presentation. Thank you all for coming out and learning about these crazy stories.